Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. And welcome to today's Container Journal program brought to you by TechStrong. We've got an exciting program ahead of you, but before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping notes. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss our discussion or would like to share with a friend, our on-demand recording will be made available to you today shortly after the recording concludes with a link as well. If you have any questions or would like to submit them in the Q&A tab, be sure to do so on the right side of your screen. This is our, also where you can find the chat tab, where you can engage with our speakers as well as other audience members, share your thoughts, or just tell us where you are tuning in from. Finally, at the conclusion of today's webinar, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around and see if you are a winner. Let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar's topic, the Kubernetes Roadmap, with Mike Bazard, our Chief Content Officer at TechStrong. Um, he will also be leading the discussion today where he's joined with Robert Brennan, VP of Product Development at Fairwinds, and Joe Pell uh, Pelletier, Pelletier, VP of Product Strategy at Fairwinds. Mike, go ahead and take the floor. It's now yours. All right, thanks guys. Hey, everybody, welcome. And we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite topics, Kubernetes. I think I've been following it now for the better part of five, maybe six years, but I'm definitely on the front end of this curve. But we have a new release coming up next month. At least we think it's gonna arrive next month. It's Kubernetes 1.26. And we're also gonna be looking in the next year a little bit and see how the cadence for these release cycles are somewhat changing and how that impacts all your planning. And with that, I'm going to jump into this first question with Robert. But hey, Robert, what's your sense of what's in 1.26 coming up? And what's your sense of, um, you know, is this a major release, a minor release? And what should people be thinking about or planning for? Yeah, so I would say it's it's a fairly minor release. Um, you know, most of, most of what's going in here is... Uh, you know, bug fixes, minor enhancements, minor changes to the API, making some more data available, things like that. Uh, nothing big and new and scary. Um, there are a couple interesting uh, alpha features that are coming in, in as part of this and a few APIs that are getting removed. Um, so, you know, things to, things to watch out for as you, as you go through the upgrade. But I would say for the most part, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty tame release. All right. Joe, what's your sense of 1.26? Is there something in there hidden, a little gem that we should be thinking about? Yeah, good question. I, I think, um, you know, in general, the, the fact that this release does provide a bunch of incremental updates, it's sort of a probably a feature, not a bug of the release, right? It, it shows that Kubernetes is becoming more reliable, stable, it's being used by lots more organizations, and all that feedback is coming into the project, which is great. Um, there are a few things that I've noticed noticing thematically in the release that I think will set the groundwork, you know, for future really interesting features. Uh, the first is, you know, there's definitely some discussion around uh, improvements and, and enhancements to admission control at, at in Kubernetes 1.6. And what we're seeing is, um, you know, policy and policy enforcement concepts becoming more and more critical for companies that are, you know, embracing either lots of teams on Kube or embracing lots of clusters and need consistency. And I think these uh, changes that are being discussed are, uh, it's under the CEL admission control um, uh, enhancement, are gonna be you know, great ways to kind of bring and make policy more of a sort of a, a first class feature of Kubernetes and make it more stable and make it more widely adopted over, over the long term, right? Um, so we're excited to um, monitor that and, and, and help you know, push that forward and, and also help you know identify other use cases for the community there. I think there's a, another theme around uh, dynamic resource allocation. And, and Robert, I don't know if you've d dug into that at all or if, or if you have any thoughts on the, the policy stuff. Yeah, so the um, the policy stuff I'm actually very excited about. So the, the thing Joe mentioned, um, uh, I think it's called the validating admission policy object uh, is going to be an alpha in 1.26. Definitely something to keep an eye on, something I, I plan on playing with once we once we upgrade there. And it uses, as Joe mentioned, cell or com common expression language, I believe is what it stands for, which is a project yeah. from Google, um, which uh, basically provides kind of a, a language agnostic way of saying things like X should be greater than Y, you know, A plus B should be, you know, less than or equal to C kind of thing. Um, and so you can basically write these, these cell expressions to make sure that, uh, you know, deployments and other objects going into Kubernetes meet certain criteria, you know, a, a very... Simple example might be you want to make sure every deployment that goes in has multiple replicas available. Uh, so you could write a cell expression saying, you know, replicas has to be greater than equal to two. 
Um, and what's really cool about this, um, this validating admission policy thing is you can parameterize that. So you could say, you know, in my staging namespaces, it has to be greater than or equal to two, but in my production namespaces, it has to be greater than or equal to three. Um, so really, really cool, really powerful language to make uh, admission control logic a first class feature. Um, you know, before uh, we, we've had this validating this validating webhook policy, I believe it's called, uh, which allows you to basically create an API server that uh, will decide if something should be allowed in the cluster or not. Um, that's been really powerful, but you have to write a whole, uh, you know, probably go, um, you know, go plug in that serves an API request, um, runs the logic under the hood, has to have a Docker file. So just like a lot of setup involved. Um, this this allows you to just stick a, an expression into your um, into your configuration, and you know basically a one liner policy can be applied to the cluster. Uh, so really powerful for for doing policy as kind of a first class Kubernetes feature. Is it your sense as we look into the new year that a lot of the releases that are coming out there, I think they're on a schedule now for three a year, are going to be smaller, more digestible. Uh, modules of things that are easier to kind of upgrade through. I can think back in time where, you know, sometimes it would take me the better part of an hour to sort through all the things that are being added to a Kubernetes release. And now I feel like that's becoming a little more uh, modular or accessible. So Robert, is that where we're looking at? Or have we reached some level of maturity? Yeah, definitely um, have reached a level of maturity. I think the teams, a lot of the team's effort is going into bug fixing, making sure features are nice and stable. You know, there's there's so many organizations relying on Kubernetes in production now uh, that I think the uh, there's just a, a shift of incentives from shipping major new features to get people to adopt it over towards making sure it's stable, reliable, uh, bugs are being squashed, etc. Um, so I do think you're going to see you know fewer fewer major features and more of that just you know normal um, you know tech debt uh, type stuff coming in. And Joe, as part of that conversation, do you think it seems to me a lot of the effort is also around maybe improving storage because we're getting more stateful applications, improving security because mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, security is once again an afterthought. But, you know, yeah. are we kind of looking at some more of this fundamental stuff that, you know, trips people up a lot and, you know, it's better for the folks who have it versus trying to attract yet another workload kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think we're going to see a little bit more of that in general, but uh, I, I think there's still a long kind of runway and a lot of room to go before you before Kubernetes will kind of bring all those features in a single release, right? So uh, for example, I think you're right, we're seeing a lot more kind of emphasis on bringing storage capabilities into Kubernetes. I mean, there already are storage capabilities in Kubernetes, but making it even more easier, resilient, stable to run. Uh, you know, there was a time where, you know, folks would say, no, don't run your storage on Kubernetes, but I think that world is changing now, right? And, um, you know, but even even with uh, those types of that progress, I think th the beauty of Kubernetes is it's flexible and, and uh, adaptable and that there's still going to be sort of additional kind of capabilities you have to bring to your Kubernetes infrastructure around security monitoring or runtime monitoring, around being able to federate policy across multiple clusters, um, you know, cost allocation and being able to kind of monitor um, how much workloads are, you know, uh, are using or spending. So there's still a lot of additional add-ons that I think companies need to really have that full visibility and control. And, and frankly, I don't know if, if it makes sense for Kubernetes to solve all of those problems, right? I think it might want to continue being sort of that, you know, make it easy to integrate and extend, but not necessarily, you know, uh, bring the capability itself to the core, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Joe. I think Kubernetes has done an awesome job of making itself extensible through custom resource definitions uh, and other other features. Uh, and I think they'll want to continue pushing off some of the the responsibility of doing things like you know provisioning SSL certificates, um, doing ingress, interacting with the cloud providers, things like that. Uh, well, they'll probably want to leave that to uh, to third party extensions and not bring that into the core project. Mm -hmm. Robert, do you think that the whole process of uh, deprecating APIs will get a little less uh, dramatic as we go along? We recently had the whole adventure with Docker Shim, and uh, you know the issue people are running into, it seems like, is that you know they used an API that may have been in a beta in you know three releases ago, and suddenly it disappears, and now they're like, my app doesn't work. So you know, does that process need to get a little smoother, or 
do you think we're kind of fixing that issue as we go along? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's it's kind of a perpetual problem just in software in general, but uh, especially with Kubernetes. Um, I would say, uh, you know, in this release, the only major uh, API that's getting removed, I think, is the uh, V1 uh, horizontal pod autoscaler, uh, which I know a lot of folks rely on. We, we rely on it. Um, we've, we've mostly upgraded to V2, which is awesome. It's much more powerful. Um, but, you know, it's it's a little bit of a chore to go in and, and fix all those things. Um, I don't know that it's, you know, I, I think there's there's some hope within the community that this is going to get easier over time, that APIs are going to be deprecated more slowly. I don't think the problem is ever going to go away um, just because uh, as the team adds new features, um, you know, not everything's backward compatible. Um, you know, some mistakes are made along the way in API design. Like you just kind of need to cut new major releases of APIs that aren't, aren't backward compatible. Um, but hopefully, it, you know, as things become more stable over time, it becomes less and less of a problem. Um, and hopefully there are more, you know, automated ways of upgrading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also say, like, there's increasingly more and more tooling in the community to help kind of uh, monitor and uh, for these, de these different deprecations and be able to kind of address them. And a lot of that tooling is now uh, not only things that you can run in your running cluster to understand, you know, what are some deprecated APIs that I have in my cluster today that I need to get ahead of of the next upgrade, but you can also implement them into like CI CD pipelines so that as developers or DevOps engineers are making changes to their YAML, you can detect these issues, you know, as early as the pull request. And um, so I think the tooling is getting better in the community. I mean, Fairwinds does have a, a tool called Pluto that, that helps with detecting these uh, types of deprecations. Um, and so there, I think, you know, in, in the interim, there are ways to be able to kind of better manage uh, deprecations uh, that are being made. It seems to me when I talk to people, um, they're running a lot of different versions of clusters and I don't know how far back they go, but Robert, maybe you might have some experience here, but you know, are people still running uh, as far back as, I don't know, 115, 112, or you know, there are other folks who are keeping pace with it, but what's your sense of, what prevents somebody from keeping pace with the current cycle and how far back or, you know, how big a tail are we looking at? Yeah, it definitely does get pretty bad. I mean, some, some organizations adopted it very early. Um, you know, it's, it's been a couple of years, but, uh, you know, only a couple of years ago, I heard of somebody on 1.8, you know, a big, a big company that was just kind of stuck um, because there were big breaking changes and they just didn't have the time and effort to, to like go and fix it all. And everything was working, you know, they were running it all themselves. They weren't using, uh, you know, a managed uh, managed Kubernetes service like EKS or GKE that's going to force you to upgrade. So they just kept running those servers and, you know, it kept working. Um, granted, there are, you know, security holes that aren't going unpatched and things like that. Um, and I think eventually they managed to get upgraded. Uh, but there's definitely a long tail um, of folks that are still in old versions. Uh, one nice thing about the managed providers like EKS and GKE is they kind of force people into upgrading eventually. You can get a few versions back, but at some point they just cut off support and say, we're going to force you into an upgrade, even if it breaks everything. So you kind of have to be on top of it, um, you know, which is which is annoying if you're managing one of those clusters and you, uh, you know, are, are have a, a thinly stretched team. Um, but it's good. It kind of forces you to, to practice good hygiene uh, because being on those on those old unsupported versions, it, it can be, uh, you know, a big security problem for one thing. Um, so I think, uh, one, one thing that's difficult for us as a, uh, company that provides tooling around Kubernetes is to make sure that we're supporting, you know, as many versions back as our customers go. Um, fortunately we're seeing, we're seeing less and less of that long tail, uh, but it's still, it's still a problem. Yeah. And, and one thing I would say too, is like upgrading your Kubernetes core version is one thing, right? I mean, obviously that's a, that uh, can be a big challenge depending on how far back you are. I, I think even after you're upgraded though, you know, the next level of, of version management really comes down to the add-on layer and the different kind of supporting services that uh, are running that cluster. So if it's, you know, um, ingress controllers or DNS or certificate management, you know, those uh, tools also have to be upgraded uh, for security reasons, but also just to kind of improve reliability with, you know, with the latest version. And, and sometimes upgrading those uh, add-ons may be, you know, straightforward as just changing the version and everything works. Other times it may introduce breaking versions that have to be tested, right? So uh, I still think that, you know, the overall version management problem is still kind of a complicated thing. One that does require, you know, some advanced planning, some testing in order to, you know, uh, do it well without, you know, introducing any regressions along the way. 
Yeah. You know, Robert, it occurs to me, uh, there's a philosophical debate at the core of all of this, and it kind of goes to the following point. It's like um, the committee itself seems to not favor the notion of a long-term release that we've seen in some other open source projects. And what they're arguing is, is that, you know, you should be stay current and you should be adopting best DevOps practices. And, you know, so what's your sense of the, the yin and the yang of that conversation? And, you know, where, where should people be thinking about where they want to fall in that spectrum? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I do think Kubernetes airs heavily on the side of you should always be up to date, always, you know, maybe not on the bleeding edge version, but, you know, at least, you know, minus one, minus two versions back. Um, and, you know, like I said before, a lot of the managed service providers uh, like EKS and GKE will, will enforce that pretty heavily. So um, I do think it's it's healthy, um, but there's a, there's a cost to it, right? I think a company that adopts Kubernetes, like you, you just have to accept that a certain amount of your time, a certain amount of your engineering resources is going to be spent on uh, just making sure you're keeping Kubernetes up to date. Um, you're going to have, you know, maybe a quarterly, a quarterly sprint, you know, where you have to spend two weeks um, just making sure that, you know, all your new API versions have been updated, that you've updated your add-ons, that you've updated Kubernetes itself. Um, I think it's possible that, you know, when, when Kubernetes finally gets around to like a 2.0 release, something with big major breaking changes that they keep around a stable 1.x um, for companies who aren't able to get up to 2.x. Um, which won't be upgrading uh, as as frequently since they'll be focused on 2.x. Uh, we'll see if that actually plays out or not. Um, it would definitely be nice though for some of those larger enterprises that you know maybe don't uh, don't want to invest as much time in always staying up to the latest version. Joe, do you have any sense of how many people are running not just different versions of Kubernetes but different distributions of Kubernetes that are being curated by different people at different rates and speed and does that add a, another level of challenge into our management thoughts here? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's something that we um, are uh, we keep tabs of just from our own perspective because we develop software that runs um, you know on Kubernetes itself. I would say though that on um, on the whole, we're seeing lots of the managed Kubernetes uh, provider managed Kubernetes services with the cloud providers being kind of leveraged increasingly more and more. So you will have you know EKS or AKS or GKE kind of at the core, which which helps provide a, a certain amount of consistency. And then when it comes to the sort of the distributions, uh, we we tend to see that either in sort of hybrid cloud or on-prem type scenarios, right? So um, I think where it gets a little challenging is when you look at um, you know different types of uh, container engines like OpenShift and making sure that that can also work with Kubernetes software. I think those are that's probably to me the biggest area where there's challenge. But increasingly, I think the Kubernetes API um, is really that common denominator across all these distributions, and that's really what vendor tooling is and and different kind of add-ons are trying to integrate with, making it um, you know making it really kind of compatible whether you're on the cloud on-prem as long as it's a Kubernetes core you're really, you know, you're getting that sort of interoperability. Robert, early on, we saw people were using raw bits of Kubernetes that they were taking off the open source project. Um, are people still doing that? And do you recommend that? Or should everybody be on some form of a curated instance of Kubernetes where somebody else is kind of taking the bullet for them every time there's a change in the release? Yeah, I think I think more and more everybody should be using a managed Kubernetes provider like EKS or GKE. Um, I think managing your own control plane is just it's too much of a headache. It's too error prone. There's too many security issues that you can introduce. Um, you know, it's hard to hard to stay up to date, um, hard to manage yourself. Um, so so using like an EKS or GKE is, is super helpful. Um, it's a little a little harder on prem, um, but, uh, you know, there, there are some management services for on-prem uh, Kubernetes installations as well. Um, so I think I think as much as you can kind of offload to a service, uh, the the better, especially if you're not like, um, you know, if you're, if you're a typical uh, software company, you know, an e-commerce company or, you know, a retailer of some kind, like you really don't need to, to you know, your, your, your um, core differentiation is not managing Kubernetes, right? Um, if you're, if you're hyper-technical, you're running like machine learning workloads on Kubernetes, you need to manage GPU instances and things like that. Maybe it makes more sense for you to get into the guts of it and manage how things go. Um, but for the most part, you know, EKS, GKE is, is the way to go. Joe, do you see the same things? And as part of that, um, 
do I need just need a managed curated version of Kubernetes or are ultimately people looking for some sort of, you know, Kubernetes plus managed thing where I'm going to yeah. get um, Prometheus and everything else that kind of goes with it because we are making a better effort of not having everything loaded into Kubernetes itself, but there's this right. stack that needs to be managed. So or is that going to evolve as we go forward? Yeah, well, I think we're already seeing that that type of decision tree, you know, in the uh, in sort of organizations who are going cloud native, right? So um, I think if if you're an organization and and like Robert said, like you have to decide is you know running my own operations with my own expertise core to my business, and and for some companies it may be if you have really interesting scalability needs or you need to run hybrid cloud or multi cloud for for business resiliency reasons or or just business reasons, right? And so. Um, but if you're an organization where it's all about shipping product to customer and, and, and you know, delighting the customer and meeting and being able to kind of innovate and get things out quickly, you know, you may want to focus more of your efforts on sort of the application layer and less so on the infrastructure layer. And I think you're seeing, you know, organizations go down this decision tree of like, do I want to, you know, manage my own infrastructure on top of a cloud provider like, uh, you know, EKS, GKE or AKS? Or do I want to leverage sort of a, what we call a managed service provider who's, who owns more of the infrastructure stack, may take on responsibility for more of the add-on layer that, you know, uh, makes Kubernetes more complete and, you know, go down that route. And I think that is becoming a popular decision point. Um, I, I would say that we're even within sort of the, um, the, ma the typical managed Kubernetes software, we're seeing kind of even kind of uh, plus plus versions where they're you know, becoming more and more opinionated. And so mm -hmm. even though it's not sort of a full on managed service, there's more opinionated managed services out there that act as sort of like a middle road. So um, I do think the different flavors of management are helpful. You know, it, at the end of the day, if you're trying to, you know, work on your application, get product out to customer and, and make them happy, you might off, you might want to offload some of the responsibility around Kubernetes management to um, sort of an opinionated uh, software or, or full on managed service provider. Yeah. I think I think the uh, the really important thing is that within an organization, you should try and stay consistent as possible, uh, as consistent as possible. I think a lot of uh, a lot of organizations that struggle with Kubernetes right now, especially the larger ones, have kind of a wild west thing where any any team can spin up a cluster, they can put whatever they want in it. Uh, there's no consistency around versioning, around which add-ons get installed, etc. That makes it just a nightmare for the operations team or the security team to kind of wrap their arms around their Kubernetes footprint and understand like, what are we running? Where are we running it? What's the security profile, et cetera? How much is it costing us? Um, so the best organizations seem to put in a set of standards and say, we're going to run this ingress tooling, uh, you know, at this version, we're going to run Kubernetes between these versions at all times. Um, you know, they'll make sure that specific security tooling is installed in every cluster, uh, cost reporting tooling is installed in every cluster, et cetera. Um, I think having that kind of opinionated stack, at least within an organization, is super important. Joe, are you seeing more of that kind of what I would call adult supervision, where developers are not being just left to their own devices and spinning up clusters whenever they see fit? Because eventually the developer moves on and then they say, you know, here's this little puppy I gave you and good luck with it. So, you know, or, or and what does that look like? Is there a, an IT ops team? Is it a DevOps team or who's kind of stepping up here? Yeah, so it's a great question because the it runs the gamut, I think, in terms of the organization, right? Like I would say as companies move more towards embracing cloud native, using more and more cloud native technologies like Kubernetes and containers, they end up getting into this problem of how do I systematize and make it so that I am consistent in terms of my deployments, they're secure and cost effective from from the start. And um, when, when you do that, you really need to kind of set up, you know, a concept of like sort of guardrails for your development team. So as, as developers come and go, you know, their job is to focus on writing great software, great features, and we want to keep them focused as much as possible on that, right? But they're leveraging Kubernetes and containers to ship their application multiple times a day or week. And as they get those apps out there, there's still a certain amount of consistency and security and, and cost efficiency that you need to apply at that deployment time. And so being able to push that feedback to a developer, whether it's a new one, developer on the team or one that's been working on that team for a long time is, is important because you want to make sure, if, you know, they're getting the feedback as early as possible, addressing any sort of configuration errors um, and not making the DevOps team sort of that 
single point of failure where they're the ones stuck having to do code reviews or they're ones gating releases, right? We, we, we can't have DevOps be the one that's holding back innovation. We want them to be the enablers of innovation. And I think that's why things like guardrails and even sort of the, the policy enhancements that we're seeing starting to get introduced in 1.26 are going to be so powerful because it's really going to ultimately enable Kubernetes adoption at much larger scale than we're seeing today. Yeah. Robert, are you seeing people lean more on some sort of managed service, not just from the cloud providers, but you know, from somebody, a third party to manage all of this? Because when I talk to a lot more folks lately, it seems like they're trying to allocate more of their resources towards actually writing code versus managing the platform. So where are we on that curve? Yeah, I think the, the, the big word uh, that Joe mentioned is guardrails. Um, you know, people like you're, you're totally right, Mike, they don't, they don't want to spend all their time writing, uh, you know, writing policy and managing the clusters. They don't want to spend all this manual effort kind of managing the Kubernetes environment. Um, so the more they can automate that by putting guardrails in place, um, you know, setting up, uh, setting up, you know, basic policies that say, this is what you can do. This is what you can't do. And then the developers can, can be very confident that when they ship things, those things are going to work. They're not going to have security holes, et cetera. And they're going to be stopped uh, if they do do something that, you know, might might be, uh, you know, cause, cause problems down the line, whether it's with security or cost or whatever else. Um, so I do see a lot, a lot of companies, you know, adopting uh, guardrails platforms like Fairwinds uh, to make sure that they can allow their development teams to move quickly, spend most of their time working on shipping applications and not spend so much time, you know, debugging things that are breaking in production. Yeah. And, and what just can make that a real example, Mike, like we've um, one thing that the FinOps Foundation really recently came out with is a, a kind of container uh, labeling dictionary, which is really cool because it allows, you know, and establishes sort of at a minimum framework for uh, what are the labels that should be on a workload uh, before you deploy it in production. And the reason why that's important is a lot of companies, as they move to Kubernetes, they're not able to kind of get visibility into the cost of their workloads. And so these labels are important for allocating costs appropriately. And that's something that uh, can be a quick decision made by uh, an engineering team, you know, at, right when they're getting ready to deploy, they can apply their labels so that, you know, later on in the runtime, you're not having a bunch of, mis you know, unknown you know, uh, cost uh, issues or, or you're, you're able to actually allocate costs more effectively. And I think that's an area where, guardrails and uh, can help teams not only go faster, but just be more consistent and um, leverage Kubernetes even more broadly down the road. Yeah. Robert, one of our attendees is pointing out that at least in their organization, there's a client services team has emerged and that's kind of a, for lack of a better description, a, a center of excellence, shall we say, for where somebody comes in and kind of manages, or at least is a coach for these people. Do you, we need as more organizations need to create that kind of same vibe because, you know, not everybody is an expert per se in every little thing. And there's a lot of knobs and things to turn in Kubernetes, right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the things we do well at Fairwinds is helping those, those kind of centralized teams, um, a get a sense for, uh, for all the different development teams that are shipping into Kubernetes. How are they doing? Like how, you know, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? And then servicing that feedback in front of those teams through, you know, as this participant, uh, participant points out through ticketing integrations, right? So, you know, we can open up tickets in Jira and say, you know, hey, you, you've you asked for 10 gigabytes of memory for your application. It's only using one gigabyte. Like you should probably turn that down so we can save some money. Um, things like that. I think it's I think it is important to have that kind of client services team uh, with a centralized view who can hold those teams accountable. Um, but they do need a lot of automation in place so that they're not the ones fixing these problems. They're pushing that feedback out to the developers. Uh, preferably, as Joe pointed out earlier, really early on in the process, say in, in CICD, scanning infrastructure as code um, so that the developers, as they're making a pull request, they're getting that feedback instead of, say, shipping a change. And then two days later, you know, this, this client services team reaches out and says, hey, this thing you shipped, it's terrible. You need to fix it. Um, and then it just creates a really long feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Joe, are you seeing the same thing? And I'm going to ask the question with a slightly different vibe too, because, but it goes back to your FinOps point, but it seems to me early on Kubernetes was driven by, you know, advanced developers and maybe so-called full stack developers who are a fairly rare breed. And now it seems like the push is coming more from IT ops people who are like, Hey, this thing is great because we can scale up and down resources more efficiently. And, 
we can prevent people from over provisioning. So, you know, is, is, is the tail now wagging the dog a little bit? Well, I, I think, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely an evolution going on. Right. And, and ultimately what we see are comp you know, kind of taking a step back, companies are embracing cloud native because they, they want to get their software out faster to, to end customers. Like that's kind of the first principal reason of, of why they're going down this direction. And the ramifications of that are, you know, app teams are now have more influence and responsibility over their configuration, right? So that's shifted away from ops, you know, to more of the app team. And I, I think the other implication is IT ops is looking at themselves as becoming an enablement function, you know, whether it's client services or even the term platform engineering emerges around here where they're actually building the tools and building the foundation for those, for those app teams to get their app applications out there quickly. And so um, as you know, those teams kind of shift into that mindset, you know, they, they want to have guardrails and consistency to make it easier to upgrade and manage, but also make it easier for other teams to ship you know, faster as well. So I do think that this is an evolution of, of IT ops. And I think it also allows IT ops to, to help show how teams can go faster. And they're not the ones that are in the way or, or saying no, right? They're saying, here you go, you can do this. And here are the tools to be successful. And a lot of those tools are, you know, guardrails or, or providing uh, uh, tools that provide sort of service ownership, self-service access to understand what's going on with the workload in production. Yeah. Robert, looking into next year, is there anything that you think that you know, you're hearing from customers that they wish that the TOC folks would focus a little bit more or that somebody would come and magically solve for them and say, uh, yeah, you know, here's my, wh wh what's on your holiday list for most wanted thing in Kubernetes is I guess what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, so the perennial thing that, that I keep asking for is, um, you know, better, better support for persistent storage in Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has always been kind of an ephemeral place, the idea, you know, one of the big kind of um, uh, ideas behind Kubernetes is that anything can disappear at any time and you can be fine, you can rebuild it um, and then it can recover, right? Uh, that that whole assumption goes away with persistent storage, any kind of persistent state. Um, and so it kind of uh, breaks the paradigm a little bit. Um, I've seen definitely uh, a lot of improvements here. There's, there's now support for, for instance, volume snapshots, uh, which can help with a backup strategy. Uh, there are a lot of uh, third party uh, providers for backups in Kubernetes, things like that. Uh, but the more we can get, uh, you know, a, a good story around persistent storage, uh, we'll be able to take on a much bigger part of the application stack, you know, into the Kubernetes cluster and manage it in that consistent way. You know, a lot of folks are still using uh, services like RDS and S3, which live outside the cluster for all that persistent state. All right. Joe, is this whole debate about stateless versus stateful applications finally coming to an end? I mean, there was all those people out there that said, you know, thou shalt never put a stateful application on Kubernetes ever because you're going to be better off calling external storage or, but you know, I always ask the question, it's like, well, dude, what if I don't have external storage? What am I supposed to do? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I, I, um, I don't have as much firsthand experience with the stateless versus stateful concepts, but I, you know, kind of taking a step back, I have seen uh, more and more kind of evidence that you, you, it's becoming more and more possible and, and easier to run stateful applications in Kube. Um, I don't have enough firsthand experience to kind of say whether that's still like a, a great idea or not. I wonder, uh, Robert might have a point of view there, but I, I think that kind of goes back to a, a question you had earlier in the call, which is like, you know, where's Kubernetes going? I act, I think we're seeing a lot of that feedback come in from the community around the challenges of initially running persistent storage or stateful apps in Kube and, and how the Kubernetes roadmap is evolving to support that, you know, incrementally one feature at a time. And that's a good thing, right? O over time, we want to make that more and more possible and more and more, you know, extensible uh, so that solutions can be built around, uh, around this. Yeah. Robert, you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think Joe nailed it. It's um, you know, it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing to solve for, but I think we're we're making progress. All right. Early on, the thought was that somehow or other we would run a lot of different classes of workloads on Kubernetes clusters, and there'd be you know maybe a handful of large clusters that were shared. Reality is, it seems like we still don't like to share much anything. So now everybody's got a workload per cluster, and we're highly distributed, and we're getting all these fleets of. Yeah. Kubernetes clusters out there. And that brings us to our question from the audience, which is, you know, what's this service mesh thing about? And are we seeing more of this 
technology starting to emerge as a way to manage or help manage fleets of Kubernetes clusters. And, um, you know, from your perspective, what is the role of a service mesh? And I don't know, Joe, Robert, jump ball, anybody want to take this? Uh, Robert, I'll let you start that one. I, I have a couple uh, thoughts that I'm still putting together. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've definitely found that service mesh is still more of like an advanced Kubernetes topic, only like kind of the bigger organizations that are really um, security focused end up with a service mesh. Uh, it's a great way to enforce network policy, especially at a, at a higher level than like the built in network policies allow for. Um, you know, Linkerd, I think, is probably the crowd favorite right now, although Istio uh, has gotten a little bit more adoption from enterprises. Linkerd seems seems a little bit simpler to set up. Um, but it's a great way to kind of lock down networking, make sure that only you know, by, by default, basically any any workload in Kubernetes can communicate with any other workload in the cluster, can communicate with the external cloud, et cetera. Um, so if you've got a multi-tenant Kubernetes setup or you really want to lock it down security wise, um, you can use service mesh to do so. I think it's a, it's a really powerful tool. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree a lot with what Robert said. I think service mesh in general is still overall low adoption you know some consider it sort of the early adopters not yet mainstream users who are focusing on service mesh and i think there's trade-offs between istio and linker d i think istio does have more share at this moment um I, I also think just kind of bluntly i think these are still very complicated tools to configure and set up and i think the concept is doing network isolation and being able to you know it, uh, have um you know different types of network boundaries around your workloads is still a very hard thing. It's, it's a problem that we're, we're starting to think about here at Fairwind solving. Um, and, you know, to kind of think about service mesh relative to other uh, tools like network policies or open policy agent like OPA, I think they are all, uh, they all kind of do something different, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's, I think all these tools coming together are really trying to promote uh, sort of like, um, uh, tenancy within Kubernetes, right? Trying to make it easy for you to have different teams running in a cluster so that you, those teams can deploy their applications consistently, securely, cost-effectively, and really have that strong foundation in place that allows those teams to continue to innovate and shipping more product, but, you know, um, keeping their workloads kind of running within their, their tenant of the cluster, right? So I think they all, it all kind of comes together to kind of help solve that overall larger problem. Mm -hmm. Robert, are people revisiting Kubernetes? Because there's a lot of folks who were intimidated when they first engaged with it, right? And, you know, we have always heard that it's complicated. And yet, you know, you'll go to a demo and there'll be Kelsey Hightower there from Google and he'll write four lines of code and something amazing will happen. So where are we on this curve? Is, is it becoming accessible to mere mortals at this point? Or are we still like, you know, I got to be like the best super administrator ever? Yeah, it's definitely, um, you know, getting started with Kubernetes, I think has become easier and easier, both because, you know, the, the uh, project itself has improved over time and because uh, just the amount of resources available to folks who are just learning uh, is, is becoming, you know, uh, wide, bigger and bigger, more and more approachable. Um, I would say in terms of running it in production, though, um, it's still it's still tricky. It still, you know, takes a lot of thought and care and maintenance, um, especially if you want to do it right. Um, so I think I think you do still need um, a certain level of expertise if you if you want to be, you know, running production workloads on it. But if you're you know a developer who just wants to get a sense for what it's like, um, you know, how to deploy an application, things like that, I think it's it's much more approachable these days. Yeah. Joe, you want to add to that, or uh, because I'm going to do the follow up question from one of the audience anyway. But and the question is is you know, where should I get started with Kubernetes? Should I just, you know, use the managed service in the cloud or should I be in an on-premise environment and get to understand how it works before I rely on somebody else to manage it for me? Yeah, I think in terms of where to get started, again, it depends on what your motivation is, right? I think if you're looking to kind of learn, if you're an individual looking just to learn cloud native, learn Kubernetes, right, you know, it might, might make sense to, um, you know, start at a more kind of technical level, right? What the conversations that we have with a lot of customers are, if they're looking to move to cloud native, they're thinking about this as a big, bigger picture, right? Is hybrid cloud or multi-cloud an important aspect of their business? If not, are they on a certain cloud? And, and therefore, how can they go faster to cloud native? A lot of the answer does come into using a managed service like an EKS, AKS, or GKE, but then understanding what are the pieces that they need to own on top of that, right? So even if you use a managed service, that's not going to get you production ready, if you will, from day one. There's still a lot of other 
components you need to add. And so, you know, the next, next question is, what do I need to learn about that? What are the add-ons that I need to learn about? Or what are the different, you know, service providers that can just manage that for me, right? And so I think that's the more practical way is if you're looking to go to cloud native to help your business ship faster, what are the pieces that you can get out of the box automated for you? And what are the pieces that you have to learn and own and manage yourself? Uh, you know, on top of that. So I, th I think that's a little bit of where I would focus if I was more of a thinking about this from like a longer term business vision for my, for my team. All right. So it comes down to whether or not I really want to know how my car works or not, or if I just want to drive <laughs> and go somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Robert, what is the future here around Kubernetes? And I'm asking this in the context of the great promise of hybrid cloud computing. We've been talking about this forever and a day. And we are now finally seeing enough critical mass of Kubernetes clusters to have the conversation for real. But, you know, are, are hybrid clouds going to come our way and be real because we finally have a consistent set of APIs to deploy applications on? Or is that, you know, this time next year, we'll still be talking about that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a tricky problem. Um, you know, Kubernetes definitely makes the problem a lot easier by providing that consistent API. Um, you know, it definitely makes a, you know, a lift and shift from, say, AWS to GCP a heck of a lot easier, but it's, it's, there's still a lot involved, right? Um, especially, you know, if, you're, if your applications are using um, some native features that uh, might be specific to different, um, different cloud providers, like load balancing is often something that's controlled at the cloud provider level. Um, storage classes can change depending on your cloud provider. So there's still a lot of work uh, that needs to go into shifting a workload from a Kubernetes installation on one cloud provider versus another. Um, but it definitely, it's an easier story today. Uh, we do talk to a lot of companies who are on two or three different cloud providers, um, you know, both running Kubernetes in, in, in different cloud providers. Um, and I would say they definitely have an easier time than folks that are just running bare workloads in those cloud providers. Um, but it's still, I think there's always going to be a certain amount of, um, of difficulty there. I mean, you know, in part, just because the cloud providers kind of want to lock you in a little bit. And so they're going to offer new functionality that extends Kubernetes in, in interesting ways and maybe isn't as interoperable as Kubernetes would like to be. Mm -hmm. Joe, do you think security is going to be a bigger issue in the coming year? Because you know, now that we have that critical mass, you know, the bad guys starting to figure out this Kubernetes thing and they're looking harder at it and they're like going, hey, there's some really interesting workloads on these things. Yeah, I mean, I think any, I think security is always going to be a, a a pain point, right? For it, for any uh, technology, I think there's a, a larger theme happening in in this space, which is, you know, cloud native has invented a whole new way of, of doing operations, and and it's becoming. And we were talking about earlier how the developer has a lot more influence and control, right? So, being able, you know, you're going to see a lot more of um, cloud native security considerations moving into various different tools. You're going to see monitoring tools try to get a, uh, help you with that. You're going to see different application security tools also help you with that. And that's because the personas involved, DevOps, developer, are all part of this cloud native you know, journey, right? And so you're going to, the importance of security is only going to increase. Um, I also think we're at a point where there's a large number of tools that report problems out uh, around, you know, here's the state of the, your cluster, here's the issues that we're seeing. Uh, the next wave of innovation is going to be around how do those tools help you remediate faster in a way that uh, creates, you know, isn't sort of temporary band-aids, but kind of fixes the issues at the source and makes that easy for developers. And so I, I do see kind of um, an evolution happening around security to make it easier and more kind of uh, mainstream in terms of uh, cloud native is, is be security is becoming kind of part of all the different stacks, whether it's a monitoring stack, apps, app security stack, or um, your existing Kubernetes security tooling. All right. Robert, let's ask a question here that goes to maybe more of the selfish in interest of the audience. But do you think that the way IT organizations are structured is going to change as we get more and more Kubernetes clusters out there? Because we will see people unifying the management of compute, storage, and networking, and maybe applications to a degree. So, um, you know, are, are we about to have a massive conversation about where's my cheese and who moved it? Yeah, I think it's uh, I, I think that that change in organizational structure has gone hand in hand with the adoption of Kubernetes. Um, the whole the whole promise of DevOps, I think, is, is enabled by Kubernetes. And we've seen organization organizations uh, shift around their adoption of Kubernetes towards a more a DevOps oriented model where 
you have a centralized platform team or operations team who's responsible for the core infrastructure and making decisions there about you know what versions of what things are we going to use and then you have development teams who are responsible for all their deployment infrastructure right they're responsible for dockerizing their application they're responsible for shipping it into production they're responsible for their you know helm chart or whatever other kubernetes configuration wrap the application um, and that's that's a shift from the old days where uh, a lot of that uh, responsibility was shifted over toward the operations team. Um, and so I think I think that's meant smaller operations teams and more more operations folks who are embedded within the, the development teams. Um, I think you're going to continue to see that shift of, uh, you know, towards a small centralized team and then more uh, more knowledge around deployment and operations embedded within each application team. Joe, that work for you? Is that what we're seeing as well? Or will there always be a need for some subset of specialists that augment that main group? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I very much think what Robert said is is on track, right? I, I think every organization is going to be slightly different, but I think on, you know, on the whole and on average, I think that's where, you know, things are going. Um you know, where it gets a little interesting are companies that are going through that that shift from, you know, on-prem or more non-cloud native approaches to, to cloud native. You're, you might have um, various groups that have that specialty, like a specialist around cloud native and, and enabling a platform engineering function versus more of an IT ops function. Uh, but on the whole, I think, you know, uh, what Robert meant, said is sort of is right on track. Mm. Robert. This is still early days as well, but are we going to see a, a shift in the types of applications being deployed? We see things like KubeVert starting to emerge, and are people going to use that to drop legacy monolithic apps on top of Kubernetes versus to centralize the management of things versus, and then maybe carve them up into microservices later? Um, is, is there going to be some near a uh, wider range of diversity in application types starting to show up on the platform? Yeah, I think that's natural. I mean, Kubernetes definitely shines around microservices and being able to scale a bunch of different things independently of each other. Um, it's a little harder to package up a you know a monolith and put it into Kubernetes, um, but I think we're seeing an increasing demand for that because you know a lot of companies as they adopted Kubernetes would put some new services on it, uh, put their microservices on it, but they still have this legacy monolith that was running in the old way, you know, on a bare EC2 instance or something like that. Um, and they want to get everything behind this unified layer of Kubernetes because they've seen the promise of it. Um, and so you are seeing things like Kubert where um, there's just increasing support, increasing documentation, increasing you know knowledge around how do you take a monolith and get it into Kubernetes? How do you take these applications that maybe traditionally don't run in Kubernetes and get them onto the platform? Another, another class of workloads might be machine learning workloads, which traditionally had solved a lot of the problems that Kubernetes solves for their own specific domain prior to Kubernetes are now um, making their way into Kubernetes um, because, because of this promise of, of being able to manage all your applications you know, behind this single pane of glass with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Joe, you can't walk down the street these days without somebody talking about AI and automation. So how automated do you think that all of this might get going forward? And are people in danger of maybe spending too much time man, figuring out how to manage something narrow that's going to be automated tomorrow? And you know what? What is the right point of entry to focus on? Yeah, interesting question. And just kind of around AI, I, I think the automation opportunities. There are still so many probably automation opportunities that don't even need AI just yet. You know that that are still kind of ready to be solved. I, I do think that there are probably roles for things around AI, right? I I think it depends on what your definition is, um, but um, you know ultimately I think there's still a lot of kind of heavyweight uh, management that may need to be uh, going on in terms of just running a Kubernetes or setting it up that um, there's probably more room just for, you know, regular automation, if you will, uh, in order to kind of make lives easier for, for developers and operations folks, um, you know, kind of a little bit tangential, but like, you know, we are seeing one use case for Kubernetes emerge around kind of running machine learning workloads in general, right? So if you do have a product that is solving um, you know, is trying to solve customer problems with AI or machine learning, Kubernetes has become a really interesting platform for scaling up those workloads to kind of solve that AI challenge and, and have that elasticity uh, to run, whether it's uh, in, in the public cloud or, or even leveraging kind of an on-prem environment for that. So I think that area of AI is, is interesting and, and one where Kubernetes can be sort of that infrastructure enabler 
uh, to help customers build applications that leverage machine learning and AI more, more sophistic in more sophisticated ways. Robert, to Joe's point, and you were talking about stateful apps earlier, but does that mean we're also going to see, you know, what we're calling data ops and data engineers start showing up in these environments? And um, and I'm going to have to figure out how to get this data engineering team and the data science team and the DevOps team and the developers, you know, kind of working hand in glove when they all have radically different cultures. So, you know, are we looking at some interesting cultural challenges in the coming year? For sure. Yeah, I think um, I think you make a good point about data engineers you know, starting to work with the platform or machine learning team starting to work with the platform. There's always a, a tough onboarding experience anytime you're trying to shift a large organization over to a new way of doing things. And there's always some resistance there. Um, but the the benefits of having everybody, you know, using a single platform, just in terms of your security footprint, in terms of what your operations folks have to deal with, um, in terms of the number of uh, different skills uh, your, your people need to have, um, in terms of who you're hiring for, you know, you will need to hire for a specific set of skills. It just makes things so much easier. Uh, so I think I think you will see organizations kind of pushing people that down that direction of adopting a single platform, most likely Kubernetes. All right. Joe, you've seen a couple of customers move down this path now. Do you have any words of wisdom or are there things that you've seen organizations do from a best practices standpoint that kind of, you know, smooth the transition? reduced the friction and generally made everybody less, uh, less agita in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I think if we kind of start at the, the business problem perspective is what, what's the business problem that you're trying to solve for. Right. And, and when we talk to customers, a lot of it is trying to build new products and, and ship those products faster or, you know, take existing products and, and enable more speed to market for their customer. Right. And, when we, we see customers thinking about cloud native and, and wanting to kind of solve those problems, you know, they end up, you know, uh, figuring out the organizational structure that best enables that. So having teams that build the tools for app teams to be unleashed to, to ship their apps, but, you know, still have the guardrails that enforce good security practices, provide that cost allocation. Um, so you know, it's kind of a long way to say is like, it really comes down to what is the business problem that you're trying to solve and making sure that everyone, both the app side and the op side and, and the C-level are all aligned with what is that problem? Because I think that's going to ultimately help you decide the best kind of technology solutions to, to solve that, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes companies are thinking about, let's move all the workloads to the cloud or, or and, and that's all uh, good, but, uh, you know, it's going to change how your development teams also ship their apps as well, right? So figuring out, where there are opportunities to kind of enable cloud native with the with teams who are ready to go or new projects that are about to kick off, that's sometimes the the best way to get started. Mm -hmm. Robert, of course, we are seeing a lot of people who are interested in contributing to open source projects, and you have a lot of experience in this space. Is there anything that you would tell people about finding ways to contribute either to Kubernetes or any of these other open source projects that are out there that would uh, a, I guess it would help them get more expertise and experience, but in general, you know, they are part of a larger community, right? So, but it seems like when I talk to them, nobody can figure out how to engage with the community. So what's your best advice to start that conversation? Yeah, I would say, so for one thing, a lot of projects have, uh, open issues that they will label like good first issue or something like that as a way to help attract newcomers. Usually that's going to be something that's going to be fairly easy to understand as you as you get up to up and running with the project. That's really the hardest part about contributing to open source is, you know, understanding, you know, what is the architecture of this project? What do I need to change in order to have this impact on the project, et cetera? Uh, so things that are labeled good first issue is is awesome. At Fairwinds, we try to we, we manage uh, probably like a dozen open source projects and uh, about four um, like kind of flagship open source projects. Uh, and we, we try to label things good first issue. Um, in order to encourage people to come in and contribute. Um, uh, I think the other the other big thing is, uh, you know, try to contribute to projects that you actually use and contribute things that you find useful, because that's just going to be, you know, an easy way to A, know that you're, what you're doing is, uh, you know, is valuable to the open source project um, and to understand, you know, how to run it, how to test your changes, et cetera. Um, but it is always good. I always appreciate this as a maintainer. Uh, if you do have a proposal for a change or, you know, something you think there's a bug that should get fixed, um, just opening up an issue and saying, hey, here's what I would like to do uh, before going down the path of actually implementing the change, maybe putting in dozens of hours of work only to, you know, hear back from the maintainers like, oh, no, this is actually working as intended. 
or we think this is out of scope for the project, et cetera. It's always helpful to just check in with the maintainers and say, would you accept this change if I did it? Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as an open source maintainer, I, I love getting pull requests. I love when the community contributes back because it makes my job easier. It makes the project healthier, et cetera. Yeah. I would echo that. And I would also say, like, even if you're not ready to commit code, some projects have some great kind of Slack or Discord communities that you can join to hear about what's going on, contribute feedback and ideas. And so, you know, that's one thing that uh, we encourage a lot of our open source users to do is even if you're not ready to kind of commit code to a feature, join it during the community because there's a lot of opportunities to help share knowledge, share feedback with other maintainers who can um, help move a feature along for you. Yeah. Robert, there's also other ways to contribute, right? I mean, just when I look at Kubernetes itself, one of the things that strikes me is um, I'll look at the documentation about 20 minutes in, my eyes will start to cross, I get a little headache going on. So are there ways to contribute to these projects that is not about writing the code, but it is about helping out that people should be thinking about? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, help, uh, helping to improve the documentation is a huge one. Um, especially as you're a new user coming at it with fresh eyes. A lot of times the documentation was written by the person who wrote the code. And so they have all this context in their head and they don't quite know how to, uh, you know, come at it with, uh, with fresh eyes or the fresh perspective and, uh, you know, write, write good, clear documentation for a new user. Um, so if you're getting up and running with a new project, um, just kind of writing down what you do as you, as you go through it um, and then contributing back, you know, anything that was lacking in the documentation, anything you were conf confused by, always super helpful. Uh, also, writing a blog post explaining what you went through as a new user, again, super helpful, something we've seen a lot for our projects, uh, people just writing those kind of getting started guides. Uh, and then another thing is, you know, like Joe said, there are often communities like uh, like a Slack um, where a lot of people will just throw in questions. Uh, and one of the best things, um, again, as an open source maintainer, one of the things that I, that I love is seeing the community come out and answer each other's questions before I can even get to it because uh, it takes work off of my plate. And uh, sometimes they'll answer questions that I didn't know immediate, you know, immediately know the answer to because they've had to work around the same issue. So it's awesome to see people within the community helping each other out. All right, we only got a couple of minutes left and we got a last minute question, but somebody wants to know, what's the future of NFS and Kubernetes? Robert, we got thoughts, more of it, less of it? You know, I, I honestly, um, I've only seen NFS and Kubernetes once or twice. Um, I think uh, it's something that folks who are, you know, passionate about network storage seem to, uh, you know, be excited about. Um, but I personally haven't used it very much, so I can't, I can't really speak to it that much. All right, we'll do some more research on that. Maybe it's a whole other webinar someday. We'll see. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you for sharing your knowledge and insight. Besides, I would have one last thought for everybody. It seems to us, at least, every time I go looking in the new job listing somewhere for DevOps, Kubernetes is suddenly a requirement everywhere. So if you want to get yourself a raise, you might want to become a Kubernetes expert. Hey, with that, gentlemen, thanks for being on. Thanks a lot. Thanks, right. Mike. I'm going to give it back to Jared, and he's going to close us out. All right. I want to say thank you again, Robert, Brennan, for taking the time to join our discussion and share your expertise with us. A quick reminder to everyone, today's session was recorded. Following this panel, you will receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You'll also be able to find the recording on our Container Journal website. Just go to containerjournal.com slash webinars, look in the on-demand section, and it will be waiting for you there. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the program, I will be giving away $25 gift cards. I'm going to mention the names and then please be sure to look in your e inbox and possibly your spam folders. Make sure that it doesn't show up there. If it does, you know what to do. Um, our four winners are going to be Thayama M, Heidi L, Vania G, and Todd S. Congratulations to the four of you. Please keep an eye out in your inbox for the gift card. If you don't receive the email, please be sure to check your spam folder. Just want to make sure you're aware that sometimes they do show up there. Again, Robert, Joe, thank you again for taking the time with us. Do you have any final remarks before we close out? I don't think so. Thanks, Jared. Nope. Thank you. All right. And lastly, to our audience, thank you again for, the, for joining us for the entirety of our presentation. If you don't mind, take a moment, fill out our post-webinar survey. It'll pop up here on your screen in just a moment. And uh, please be sure to join us for our upcoming Tech Strong webinars. Have a great day, everyone. And I'm signing out. Thanks.